Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome. We have returned. It's League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you for the winner's round action. Day three from MSI 2024. And always a risk when you're from NA, depending on how early you're waking up for some of these matches. The timing a little bit better for EU, and you were blessed with actually a competitive Competitive series, Fnatic showing up on the day against top esports. And obviously, you know, Noah's saying he wants some revenge for both Ruler and for Fnatic of old against top esports. But Noah wasn't the one getting any revenge because the bot lane gap was a theme throughout this series. It was Jackie Love and Mako dishing out some home cooking, some, Cheng, some of Chengdu's finest cuisine out here for the boys at Fnatic and they uh they were eating it up and by eating it up I mean eating a lot of damage up is what was going on for <laughs> Fnatic specifically in that bottom lane yes you're right uh, there's a lot to talk about in this series but at least the, we can say about this one and unfortunately for North American fans this one at the very least was a series that we can d dive into and talk about there's actually points you can make and go through that first one Jackie Love on Lucian obviously gets insanely ahead but you had Humanoid absolutely popping off on the LeBlanc. This was very much a mid lane assassin versus AD carry throughout. Eventually, it's just too much for Humanoid to be able to do anything. But he was gapping cream in this first series. The problem was TES played around this Fed Lucian so well that he was never in much threat in these team fights. And that's just a pure familiarity type of thing never mind you know familiarity playing with what an adc is gonna do you know lucian in that posi position what jackie love is gonna do in that type of position is the other factor as well that comes in from top esports and i think a lot of them on the same page understood it and found a way to accelerate and really protect that lucian at various times throughout that later game because you're right Humanoid was a threat that needed to be dealt with, needed to be respected on the side of Fnatic, the way he was playing on the LeBlanc. I think eventually it just became one of those things where there was so much for him to deal with, there just wasn't enough for him that he was able to get that through. A champion like LeBlanc needs that little bit of a time, a little bit of reset window, right? To get that health back or to, you know, re-angle herself in, to get that right chance onto the squishy carries. It just wasn't enough there for Humanoid. He would have to go in. He would get someone. He maybe would get a second one type of thing. But eventually, run out of time. Someone catches up to the clone, pops him out. And uh, Mako was on point with his bubbles whenever Humanoid was going in to try and kill Jackie Love. But this Lucian had serious main character energy. I, I think it was, what, The Call, that ranked video a while ago with Lucian. There's a moment in this game where Oscar Rinnan comes charging in on the Scion. Jackie Love just stands there and pops his ulti and kills Oscar Rinnan before he even gets to him. Oh, it's so good. It, it replace Thresh from that video with with Scion at that point. That's pretty much what it feels like loading right there. What a clip. What a play. But for, you know, for how this series went, how this game went, you got a game two. And that game one... Fnatic, more than competitive, they look to get that bounce back. And there was a punchback from Fnatic. Humanoid has an even better LeBlanc performance in this second game to follow up again, kind of annihilating that head-to-head -head in the mid lane against Cream. Again, and pretty much all three games here, Jackie Love and Mako somehow got a 20 CS lead by 10 minutes. But luckily, the solo lanes for Fnatic, it was Razork and Humanoid getting things ahead early and... I did not have the first Camille of the tournament going to Oscar Rinnan matching up opposite 369. You told me heading into this series that we were going to see a Camille. I go, oh no, we're getting 369 Camille out. This is dangerous for Fnatic. Oh, the danger is on Fnatic. It's Oscar and playing the Camille. That is the crazy thing. And yes, he gets the success. He was looking fantastic, very comfortable on this pick and how it was gonna move around the map, what it was gonna do individually, pushing that, you know, side lane type of situation. And later on in the team fights, absolutely had the right engages for them in this game. Really think that this was a mega step up from Oscar and you already mentioned Humanoid because he was playing strong and he was continuing that in this second game as well, really creating an advantage, creating a gap for Fnatic in that mid lane, not necessarily equal 
to the gap that was going on down in the bottom lane because there certainly was one in favor of top esports at that point but enough that there was combined with Askirin's Camille that pushback and that firepower for Fnatic to be able to control things and bully their way around the map a little bit. And even though the laning phase wasn't great for the bot lane, Jun on the Renata in this game had some absolutely insane engages with the Zalti. Not quite Blitzcrank, but I'll take it. I'll take it this one on the Renata. Very impactful play from Jun here. Like this is maybe one of the brighter spots, brightest spots in this entire series for the bottom lane. Unfortunately, that's not a lot of bright spots when we're talking about this series, uh, but at least you take this one and you look on it moving forward. And there were lots of crazy early game level ones, not just in this series, this tournament. Well, I don't know if it's because lane swaps are always a threat, but we've seen a lot of 4v4, 5v5s at level one. As we get to that third and decisive game, it's not level one, but it's, I think guys are like level three or four, the skirmish in the bot lane where Jackie Love and Mako are somehow turning around a 2v3. This is the absolute turning point of this third game so early. And, and it's such a backbreaker to happen early because of that dread that sets in once you realize, oh, that's a lot of advantages. That's a lot of acceleration. And that's acceleration on the most lethal member of this top esports team. And that was certainly put to use by top esports, by Mako in the bottom lane, helping Jackie Love. I mean, Mako's really... 1v1 in mid laners on this support, Ash. That, that's got to be taken into account. I think we saw a little bit earlier, we can talk about Kyria on the Ash, pretty darn lethal, pretty darn, you know, all over the place as well with, with the regards to her arrow. A little bit more for Mako in this series, finding that effect, and it really did make a difference against Fnatic. But this is the prime example of the gap between the East and West because Noah and Jun on Zaya Rakan were bodying everybody in the LEC, when they locked in that duo, it felt like an inevitability that Noah was going to get crazy fed, and as soon as he got three items, Fnatic was just going to close out the game. They lock it in against top esports, and Jackie Love and Mako completely shut it down. It felt like Noah never really got online in any three of these games because they got so stomped in lane. The biggest and easiest kind of test and eyeball test for that type of situation is when you're watching, you know, No Engine and especially that Zyra Khan duo as you talked about and you get to see that domestically, you know how strong, how potent that combo is. You realize, oh yeah, there's all these certain things that they get each in, you know, in their individual ways that become better when they're paired together, that type of thing. You didn't really notice that in this one when you're watching that Zyra Khan duo, you're not going all of a sudden, oh man, yeah, Rakan's really got that extra range, you know, to really go in for it and all these things. You're not mentioning those things because it's never a factor due to the advantage that was there and the power from uh, the top esports bottom lane. Still competitive enough of a series out of Fnatic that you're feeling real good about them against Gam or Loud, whoever they're playing to qualify. Obviously, top esports, as expected, heading on to that next round, but they did drop a game. So big thumbs up for EU a lot more than you could say out of North America on the day. And I'll just say you had a lovely first blood play in game one, inspired in Whippo going up against Zeus and then the stream died. I, I, the rest, the series just didn't finish from there. I think it got delayed, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, LCS Commissioner Mark Z came on and said, ah, we can't, you know, there, yeah. there's some issues. Call it, it's there. raining outside, call the match. Oh, yeah. No one wants to. You can't watch League of Legends in the rain. No, no. way. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. The series did play out and it was all T1. And when I say all T1, that's that's not like just, oh, it's an express. It was all T1 in this situation. Normally you see losses, even blowout losses. You're finding a couple, a handful, two, maybe three clips. You're getting a solo kill. You're maybe taking a turret or something like that. And then the rest of the highlights are the winning team. And it was, it was all T1 outside of that early first blood that Bwipo and Inspired get, which nice play, proactive play for FlyQuest. It comes with the caveat, of course, of knowing that, yes, there's a lot invested for this one and it's leaving you vulnerable for a counterpunch from T1, a counterpunch that was successful from T1, of course, because a lot of things were successful for T1 in this game and they continued to be all the way through game one and into game two. It, uh, it felt like FlyQuest 
I thought we were playing speed run. It's whoever gets first blood wins the game. Well, I, I thought the game's over, but no, they don't get a single kill the rest of that game. This whole series, FlyQuest does not get a single turret. And this more so than ever. I mean, game one, it was 45 seconds longer than the infamous 1647 Mad Lions lost to T1. They do it again to another squad, a sub 18 minute absolute stump. There was only one dragon taken in that first game before the game's over. And the most wild thing about all of this is that it'd be so easy, it'd be so natural to just go, oh my God, FlyQuest, LCS, Doggy, Doodoo, what is this? All that type of stuff and the reactions. There were mistakes. There was some doo-doo from FlyQuest, no, no question about it. But it was how T1 operated on those mistakes and kept that flow going and started to put that pressure down on FlyQuest from that point on, that's the difference. You find any of these minor regions, you get another LCS team, heck, throw another LEC team in there. I don't think you get punished. You don't have unplayable game states the way that you do against T1 in this situation off of those mistakes, absolutely perfection. And okay, listen, game two, great. You lasted 10 minutes longer. You get 11 kills as opposed to one, but it really felt like T1 was just playing with their food throughout this, just having a little bun. It, it truly, not even a scrim, it feels like when you pop in and your buddies are making new accounts. So you make a new account, but you're actually like a challenger level player going against some of these squads. The moment where Jensen, the whole team basically gets killed for FlyQuest, then he TPs back and immediately gets blown up. That felt like a normal game. This feels like when you're playing, I don't know if anyone has like little nieces and nephews type of situations where you're like, oh, you, you know, yeah, you got me. Oh, you got me this round type of thing. And you know, that's what the first blood was in game one. Oh, you got me. It's fire. Oh, man. That's exactly how it felt from T1. And then it was all business. It was all seriousness from them and how things were going. And you saw it. Heck, man, even Faker, I'm questioning. I don't know if he was TPing in to get an actual play or if he just knew because it was the LCS, because of FlyQuest and the situation, how things were going. I can TP in. Everybody's baited into trying to go on me, and I still got my crew, and we're going to turn this fight around. Yes, T1 did turn that fight around, and yes, Faker was more than okay after that teleport. Not like Jensen after his teleport. Maybe he felt bad, too. He said, I'm going to TP in. Maybe I'll give him a freebie. I ah, know. We, we still cleaned that one up. There was multiple fights where T1 eventually, I mean, they had a 17K gold lead in game two. They had a 13K gold lead at 17 minutes in the first game. You can't even really pick anyone on FlyQuest and say, oh, Masu wasn't up to the task against Guma because top to bottom, micro, macro, everything on the Rift, they were just completely gapped today. Well, they previewed the series by having Masu talk about obviously how much he respects and is excited to play against Kumiyushi and T1 and that's all, you know, wonderful and everything else and recognizing, you know what, probably a learning experience at the end of the day type of situation. And as long as if Masu's recognizing that and we're all talking about it, you got a little bit of a worrisome attitude going on in this situation because there was a lot to learn from it and experience in this situation. Uh, none of it all that pleasant from Mr. Moss. I don't even know how much you could learn from this. Okay, okay. so it's that famous copy pasta. All we need to work on is our early game, mid game, late game, laning phase, objective, like everything you have to work on after this. Oh man, and uh, you know, there's so much to talk about all the stats and, and history that still exists here, of course, outside of Masu Abusio, which is the young bottom lane for FlyQuest. You can go and look at the veteran players of, of Whippo and Inspired. I don't think either one were necessarily egregiously bad, but didn't step up to the way that we challenged them and issued that, you know, request here and what was going to be necessary for FlyQuest to make this an interesting matchup against T1. Didn't happen. And then, of course, we check in with the clapping Mr. Jensen in the mid lane. He surely thought that this would be the year. This Part would be the seven. time. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, let me tell you, this is, I think, 10 in a row now for Faker whipping down on Jensen. Look, this is not no shame in it, man. It happens, but it is an incredible stat to look at and talk about. And listen. FlyQuest have to bounce back. Their tournament's not over. They're still going to be favorites against PSG or Astral, whoever they uh, ends up winning that matchup. They're still going to be favorites. They'll still 
probably, unless their mental is completely crumbled and shattered after T1, get through. But this play-in stage feels like when you play games where you can change the difficulty setting at any time. PSG FlyQuest is like, that's a little bit too easy. Maybe I'll try, I'll try a couple difficulties harder. And then they match up against T1 and you immediately go, send that slider right back. <laughs> It's like someone that's like, yeah, I'm going to play Mario 64. And, oh, what's my second game? Yeah, give me Dark Souls. Give me Dark Souls. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm ready for that right away into that situation. It, it This is so weird when you think about it because you're talking about it from FlyQuest. And how do you rebound from this type of situation? Don't take too much you know, stock in it. You realize this is more or less the reward, if you can believe it, from beating PSG yesterday is that you had the honor to get dismantled by T1. They're the world champs. You go, okay, okay. Sure, absolutely. And you still have that extra life. You now get to go down and you get to reset. You get to take what you learned and what you didn't learn, of course, against T1 and get beat down with and reapproach it. Have a new day, new lease on life type of situation. You've also, though, opened the window. For a straw and PSG to see you get your pants taken down and absolutely wibble wappled out there by T1. And now they know that you are absolutely vulnerable. They've seen you bleed. They know it's possible. And man, they've seen you be embarrassed. So that's got to be something that you're taking into this next series. And does FlyQuest bounce back angry saying, man, you hate being embarrassed on the international stage like that? Or are they second guessing themselves? That's what... The opportunity is ahead of them against either of these squads to qualify. But for now, T1 and TES, as everybody in the universe predicted, sitting pretty, waiting in that main stage of MSI. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for hanging out, as always. And we will catch you on that flippity flip.